Good morning, everyone. Welcome to our May 8th clinical conference. I'm very delighted to introduce our two speakers in this topic of low barrier care models for HIV prevention and treatment. Um, first, uh, Dr. Raka Kumbakar. Uh, she's a clinical assistant professor in the Division of Allergy and Infectious Diseases, and she is one of our core clinical faculty at a Madison Clinic, working in Madison Clinic and MOD or Moderate Needs uh, um, Services Clinic at Madison, which is our walk in model, and she'll talk more about that. And then Jimmy Ma, who is an acting instructor also in the Division of Allergy and Infectious Diseases here at University of Washington. And he also works in the MOD clinic, but also does an offsite clinic um, at Engage. And I forgot to mention that Raka does an offsite clinic too at Aurora Clinic. So they both are well-versed in these care models and I'm delighted to have them speak about it. So I'll let you take it away. Great, thank you so much, Sharisha, for that introduction. And I think we'd be remiss in saying that Sharisha is kind of the global arching, one of the, the main people who thinks about low barrier uh, care here at Madison and at the University of Washington. We're really lucky to work with her. Um, so as she said, I'm Raka, I'm here with Jimmy, and we're really excited to talk to you about low barrier care models for HIV prevention and treatment. We have no disclosures except for, as Dr. Dan already mentioned, we're both providers in some of the low barrier clinics ourselves. We just wanna take a moment to state that data in this presentation offer a limited perspective of various factors and their impact on health, and that we recognize that racism, not race, creates and perpetuates health disparities. So today our goal to you is really to present a framework for thinking about providing low barrier care for HIV treatment and prevention. And that's gonna involve discussion of a few concepts. So our objectives are to review a status neutral approach to HIV prevention and treatment, to discuss how differentiated service delivery can be adapted for HIV in the United States, discuss the elements of low barrier care, and then here in Seattle to describe low barrier care models for HIV treatment for people with HIV and to review the experience in implementing status neutral low barrier care. So first we'll start off with frameworks that inform low barrier care and I'll hand off to Jimmy to introduce the concept of status neutral care. Thanks, Raka. Um, I'll start by introducing status neutral care for HIV and what it is. We're living in a really exciting time in HIV care where we have many tools to reduce or eliminate HIV, including PrEP, really well tolerated ART that's really potent and um, well tolerated, uh, and strategies such as treatment as prevention to disseminate these interventions widely and effectively. However, many barriers such as uh, often social determinants of health exist in traditional models of care, preventing people from fully accessing the benefits of this toolkit. And these barriers can often occur at multiple different points in care. For example, HIV and STI testing and prevention services may be separated from treatment and primary care services, making services redundant or inefficient at the systems level or for patients um, difficult to navigate or access. Wraparound services for mental health or basic social needs like housing and insurance enrollment may not be available or under-resourced. And as we all know, HIV and STIs are stigmatizing and clinics or services may often be seen similarly by association, preventing folks from actually going to those clinics. And certainly providers can also be, um, may not be fully or properly educated and as a result can be stigmatizing and have inherent biases towards individuals with HIV or STIs. Next slide, please. Um, taking a status neutral approach to HIV care can address many of these barriers and encourage engagement in HIV care. Instead of separate care continuums for HIV prevention and treatment, a status neutral approach to HIV care is a philosophy and model that emphasizes a whole person focus to engage and retain people in services, regardless if the services are for HIV treatment or prevention and continually assesses and addresses healthcare and social service needs of anyone affected by HIV, regardless of status. This has traditionally been described from the HIV test as an entry point into the model, leading to the prevention pathway if negative, or the treatment pathway if positive, with specific tailored services offered depending on the pathway. But ultimately, it's all built on a foundation of high quality, culturally competent and responsive care. This is a change from the step-by-step -step separated linear continuums of care historically seen for HIV prevention and treatment. Several important components to status neutral HIV care that has been identified by CDC include 
Healthcare that encompasses HIV testing, treatment, and prevention services, but having these services with other healthcare services, such as sexual health, LGBTQ, focused care, substance use, mental health therapy, primary care, and having these integrated with service delivery, including social services such as housing, transportation, employment, harm reduction, and ultimately having providers um, and healthcare staff that are culturally affirming, stigma-free, and delivered in uh, environments that consider and prioritize the experience for people seeking, uh, seeking these services. Next slide, please. So status neutral at its core addresses the individual from a person first, not disease first approach. I really like this figure a lot because it highlights the status neutral framework more from this perspective without a specific entry point into the system, but rather being centered around the person with the various services informing and helping a person achieve their own health goals while interfacing with HIV care services. This figure is adapted from one from CDC's implementation toolkit by ETR and a talk from the Texas Department of Health on the state's status neutral interventions. Next slide, please. Ultimately, the goals of status neutral care seeks to address social and structural barriers to engaging in HIV prevention and care by prioritizing the needs of individuals and communities to achieve self-directed goals in care. By placing individual barriers to care above HIV status, a status neutral approach improves health equity, accessibility for services, and reduces stigma and biases at multiple levels. A status neutral approach can also create opportunities to connect services, thereby increasing accessibility and efficiencies by breaking down walls between health entities, simplifying processes, and improving communication and education. In one example, New York City's status neutral intervention package uh, that they started using in 2016 integrated and expanded sexual health services rebranded these services to reduce stigma and enhanced Ryan White medi uh, medical case management. This was noted to help contribute to annual declines in new HIV diagnoses, reporting up to about 22% decrease in new diagnoses between 2016 and 2019. They found that full integration requires a thorough and deliberate approach, collaboration, potentially multiple funding sources, and an aligned message and programming for all of the various entities in their um, program. And with that, I'll hand off to Raka to talk more about differentiated service delivery and HIV care. All right, thanks so much, Jimmy. So let's shift gears now to think about DSD or differentiated HIV service delivery. So DSD is a client-centered approach and the goal is to simplify and adapt HIV services across the HIV care cascade to reflect preferences, expectations, and needs of people living with and vulnerable to HIV while reducing unnecessary burdens on the health system. So the goal is to not invest scarce resources where they aren't needed. And this is born, especially in the global setting of increasing recognition that one size fits all approaches will not work. And so what you can see here are two figures. So on the left, there's a figure outlining the three essential elements to consider in DSD. And those are clinical characteristics, specific populations, and the context. And on the right, the building blocks that are modifiable to achieve um, DSD for those targets. So the who, what, where, and when. And I really like how simple this is. It's just who's providing the care, what is the care being provided, where is it being provided, and how frequently or when is it being provided. And there's been a lot of examples in the global setting of great success with DSD. And examples um, occur throughout the care cascade. So for example, pharmacy-driven PrEP, community and peer-led PrEP delivery, fast track antiretroviral refills, adherence clubs, and community-based points of ART distribution, among many, many others. But until fairly recently, most of the studies of differentiated service delivery were really geared towards streamlining services and offering low barrier care to stable patients. And the goal then is to use fewer resources unnecessarily, but there really wasn't a push towards tailoring more intensive services to higher need patients not well engaged in conventional care. So then let's move to thinking about the context of this issue in the United States. And so as you can see in this graph, the Ryan White care system has been enormously successful. And so you can see that viral suppression has increased dramatically over the last 10 or 11, 10 or 11 years with um, a viral suppression rate of nearly 90% in 2021. And this is really great, but it means that there are a little over 10% who are not virally suppressed. And though it's not necessarily case the case that the remaining 10% all need the same strategies, included our high needs complex patients who need differentiated care and support. 
And that's to say the existing system is working well for most patients, but we need something different for the highest needs patients. And so consistent with the concept of differentiated service delivery, we need to have a tiered service strategy in the United States to match the spectrum of support among patients. And this need has been now recognized at the federal level. So this year, the HIV Medical Association published a white paper highlighting differentiated service delivery and street medicine, I should mention, as possible and the HIV epidemic or EHE solutions with recommendations for federal inf implementation actions and policy changes to scale up these strategies. And they really highlight, and I have that on the left, the complex needs of people with HIV. So unmet mental health needs, unstable housing, and health equity disparities among those newly diagnosed. And I've just highlighted here differentiated service delivery as a possible solution. And I like this phrase, ratchet up or down both the touch points with the healthcare system and interventions offered based on patient need and preference. So now that we've discussed these two concepts, we'll use them to frame low barrier care, a strategy for differentiated service delivery. And so I'll describe the Madison Clinic and Seattle experience with low barrier care for HIV treatment. And Jimmy will go on to discuss low barrier care in the context of status neutral care. So what exactly do we mean by low barrier care? So I'll start with this summary table from a recent publication from some of those leading low barrier HIV care here at University of Washington. So that's Julie Dombrowski, Matt Golden, along with Mina Ramchandani, who published this paper as a viewpoint in CID uh, just last month. And I wanna start midway through the table in the second category, the process of care elements, which I really like, they frame that as the how care is delivered elements and hone in, the, in on the philosophy of low barrier care. So right there where it says low barrier care philosophy. And the rationale they listed is adapting care goals to reflect individual patient priorities and abilities. And you can see they've listed some examples, but I think my takeaway is this really means streamlining care. So that means shortening visits if needed by clients, harm reduction approaches for not just substance use, but even in management of comorbidities. So that may involve postponing best practices or guideline-driven care and creating new patient-centered plans that are achievable for those patients. Additional elements uh, in process of care elements include multi-sector coordination. And so that means a lot of interfacing with other people who interface with our patients even more than us. And so housing agencies, jail release planners, adherence support groups, methadone treatment programs, behavioral health programs, and then also there's this idea of commitment to rapid modification that these low barrier care interventions require continual improvement to optimize the intervention and fit the specific local context, which I think is really, really important as um, the central conceit of differentiated service delivery because places and cities and even subpopulations within cities are going to be very different. Finally, the structural elements of what is delivered include some points like walk-in access to care rather than appointments because people really struggle with that. An integrated care team with case managers. And again, we can ratchet up and down um, the kind of intensity of services, but case managers who really know patients well, non-medical case management and a relatively low caseload for medical case management support. And finally, incentives. So I have a, I have a question mark ne next to incentives because among the examples I'll present to you, uh, most but not all use cash and gift card incentives for things like blood draws, returning for STI testing results, and other um, kind of achievable elements. But Mod Clinic doesn't, as I'll let you know, but all of our settings provide other incentives, food, clothing, hygiene items to some extent. And so um, I think there's gonna be some variability in how much we think incentives are needed. So we've talked about DSD and status neutral, all focusing on a whole person or person-centered approach to what an individual needs. And what I'm demonstrating here is the Madison Clinic in partnership with the Department of Health in King County has evolved structurally to integrate these into a low barrier care approach. And what I hope we're gonna illustrate for you is a spectrum of care that takes these LBC philosophies and integrates them in ways that are meaningful to local communities, contexts, and their needs. And so here's a timeline that I adapted from Dr. Dombrowski, but in order of the, their inception, those clinics within our network are the MAX Clinic or Maximum Assistance Clinic, founded in 2015, then in 2018, the MOD Clinic or Moderate Needs Clinic, then in the same year, the first offsite clinic, the SHE Clinic up on Aurora Ave, serving those who identify as women, 
And later in the same physical space, the Aurora Clinic in 2021, which serves patients ident who identify as men as well. And finally, in the last year, at Engage Health in Federal Way and Kent. And I also want to take a moment to say that the standard of care from which these low barrier clinics have evolved is really robust. So that's to say the context in which we're starting is really excellent. The Madison Clinic at Harborview Medical Center serves around 4,500 patients. There are really robust Ryan White funded services. For example, the social work team consists of about 20 people. Other Harborview clinics might only have two. We have a health educator, a patient navigator, nutrition, on-site specialty pharmacy. We have provider specialists in infectious disease, psychiatry, psychology, dermatology, neurology, cardiology. We have integrated medication for opiate use disorder. We have hepatitis treatment. And we have triage nurse and walk-in access for urgent care visits. And we're able to help patients um, undergo same-day Medicaid enrollment in Washington state. And finally, I'll note that overall viral suppression rates in the Madison Clinic, like that Ryan White uh, nationwide data I presented, is quite high, um, depending on our definition of viral suppression, really in the 90% range by the Ryan White definition. So I'll start by describing the experience of the Max Clinic. So the Max Clinic was, as you remember, the first clinic developed. It was developed to engage high-need complex patients with HIV, despite those overall successes in HIV care at Madison Clinic and in King County. And so in the Max Clinic, uh, they provide walk-in care in both the morning and afternoon. This is provided by five providers. It's operated in collaboration between public health, the Department of Health, and Madison Clinic, but it is separated, um, it is separated physically from Madison Clinic across the street. Here from a publication in 2019, I have a table highlighting what are the components of Max Clinic that, that differ from the standard care clinic approach. And you'll see that it's lo a lot of those low barrier care elements that were listed prior. So low barrier access with walk-in access, high intensity case management support, incentives, intensified care coordination, again, with outside agencies. And then the criteria for enrollment, I think really reflect what they were trying to get at with that 10% that's out of care or maybe even a subset of that 10%. So people who are not on antiretroviral therapy or who are virally unsuppressed at their last measurement were poorly engaged in HIV care and who there was a failure to re-engage in care even after multiple outreach attempts by providers, by case management and by public health. And so the Max Group published a 2019 analysis looking at HIV care outcomes among 50 patients enrolled in Max Clinic versus 100 standard of care controls, and they've published more since. But I just first want to highlight that patients in the Max Group had really high uh, rates of psychiatric illness, 78%, and that includes bipolar, schizophrenia, psychotic disorders, and depression and anxiety, high rates of methamphetamine use at 58%, unstable housing, 64%, and 68% of individuals in Max had faced prior incarceration. Next, this figure I, I show here demonstrates significant increases in viral suppression in Max patients versus the control group in the 12 months pre-enrollment to the 12 months post-enrollment. And um, adjusted for housing status, substance use, and psychiatric diagnoses, Max clinic patients had more improvement in viral suppression than the control patients. In fact, 3.2 times more. And so these are really exciting results. But I think what we have to remember is this model really does require intensive resources and funding, and as a result, might not be gen widely generalizable to all settings, nor even needed by all patients. And after its inception, Max re received referrals for patients who were missing care visits, but otherwise were virally suppressed, or who had well-controlled HIV, but other medical um, comorbidities that were unstable. And so thinking about that, again, I think everyone went back to thinking about what does differentiated care mean and what can we provide these patients who don't necessarily need Max. And as a result, keeping in mind that ratcheting up and down, spirit of DSD, the MOD or moderate needs clinic was initiated in Seattle in 2018 to meet the needs of patients with difficulties in accessing care via the traditional care model, but who don't require the degree of care provided in Max clinic. And so in the MOD clinic, we provide walk-in HIV primary care on weekday afternoons, staffed by five providers, and it's co-located with the Madison Clinic and funded by Washington DOH. MOD clinic clients are referred by social worker case management and by providers, and the criteria for referral and acceptance are really based 
on incomplete engagement and care, so missed appointments more than anything. And what we're able to provide at MOD is on-site medical case management and pharmacy services, um, the same as in Madison Clinic, but also a dedicated outreach coordinator. Again, we uh, provide medication assistance for opiate use disorder and drop-in mental health counseling. We analyzed patients in MOD from their time of enrollment up until the fall of 2021 and published our results just this past December. And what I want to highlight is like in Max Clinic, this is a high needs group. So again, high rates of substance use, 64% with meth use, 41% with injection drug use in the year prior to their enrollment, psychiatric illness, 86%, unstable housing, 52%, and prior incarceration, 45%. And then the figure on the right is to show that among patients in MOD, at the time of analysis, we had 164 patients who had 12 months of follow-up observation time. And what we were able to show is that from enrollment to 12 months post-enrollment, I'll focus on engagement and care first, that increased significantly from 37% pre-enrollment to 86% post-enrollment. Uh, sustained viral suppression also increased significantly, and then viral suppression increased, but not significantly. But I do wanna point out that as compared to Max, many more in MOD are virally suppressed. And this is to show that there, these are still people with high level of needs. We can improve engagement and care, but the goal is more in HIV continuity care. And in the second analysis in the same paper, we applied post hoc eligibility criteria to the Madison population to determine a group of MOD eligible but non enrolled patients and compare them to MOD patients. And what you can see here, and I've, I've highlighted, I think, what are the two big findings. So, first, viral suppression decreased in the comparison group arm while there was no significant difference in the MOD enrolled arm, and engagement and care increased in both arms and was 1.3 times more likely in the MOD enrolled arm. So we got higher rates of care engagement as we saw in the previous analysis in MOD enrolled. And then we have this interesting finding that the comparator group had a drop in viral suppression while MOD patients sustained their viral suppression. So this really suggests that enrollment in MOD prevented a loss of viral suppression for some patients and that there are also gonna be a subgroup of Madison patients who might benefit from MOD. And finally, I just wanna highlight that Seattle is not the only institution or city, rather, um, providing low barrier care for people with HIV. I think the most published other one that you might see in the literature is the experience of the pop-up clinic at UCSF based at Ward 86. It's very similar to Max Clinic, but one of the distinct criteria for enrollment is unstable housing. And I think, again, this is really important that Seattle and San Francisco have these specific contexts where unstable housing is really critical to who we're serving and low barrier care. In any case, they were able to demonstrate viral suppression rates of 44%, which is really impressive if you consider that the pre-enrollment viral suppression rate was 0%. And beyond San Francisco and Seattle, there are other examples of low barrier care for people with HIV in Vancouver and other uh, US cities outside of the international context. So now I'll hand off to Jimmy to highlight several examples of low barrier care using a status neutral approach. Thanks, Raka. So in this section, I'll highlight Madison Clinic's offsite low barrier clinics, which all use a status neutral approach to patient care. I first want to provide some context to the formation of She and Aurora clinics. Uh, so the first Madison offsite low barrier clinic was She Clinic, which stands for Safe, Healthy, and Empowered, uh, which came about initially due to a need for HIV and STI services for female identifying individuals living and working around Aurora Avenue in North Seattle many of whom identify as sex workers. Although this was the initial focus, talking with clients there identified a desire for full primary care, and so services were expanded. Uh, this figure shows the number of new HIV diagnoses in King County from 2008 to 2018. Green bars represent men who have sex with men and also inject drugs, while orange bars represent women and uh, men who have sex with women who inject drugs. You'll notice an increase in both bars around 2018, but the orange bar was newly and significantly increased compared to before. This new rise really worried health officials. And um, she clinic opened in 2018, about two months before the identif identification of this cluster of new HIV diagnoses among heterosexual identifying individuals, many of whom didn't have housing and injected drugs in North Seattle. There was a lot of discussion about how to engage these quote, hard to reach members of this community. And she, she uh, clinic was a key component in um, helping address this need. 
Next slide, please. From this initial context of SHE Clinic's formation, I want to spend a little time on the structure and partnerships of SHE and Aurora Clinics. One important thread throughout all of Madison's offsite low barrier clinics is that the significance of our partnerships with the community and community organizations is crucial. Without them, these clinics wouldn't be successful at all. So for SHE and Aurora Clinics, the partnership with Aurora Commons has been incredibly important. Aurora Commons has been around since 2011, dedicated to people living along North Aurora Avenue and acts as a community gathering place and service provider for folks and community partners. Their clients often don't have housing or are experiencing housing instability. The Commons provides a variety of services, including non-medical case management, housing services, or at least connection to those, um, laundry, kitchen needs, and hygiene. Individuals were already accessing services and taking care of their needs at the Commons before SHE Clinic opened. So adding medical services to a space where the community felt at home was a logical step to meet people where they are and catch them in the moment for care. SHE Clinic has grown over the years from a mobile clinic outside the Commons to being now co-located within the Commons. Starting in 2021, as we've talked about, uh, services expanded when Aurora Clinic was also founded. Together, they're open four days a week out of the same space with Aurora, Common, uh, sorry, with Aurora Clinic on Monday, Tuesdays and SHE Clinic on Wednesdays and Thursdays. SHE Clinic is uh, still for female identifying individuals continuing its original mission and Aurora Clinic has expanded services to all individuals. These clinics are funded through uh, ending the HIV epidemic funds, as well as through the Washington State Department of Health. The clinic team and Aurora Commons together have formed many other partnerships in the community over the years, expanding its footprint and services to include um, things such as rapid GYN referrals, partnerships and education for local emergency department staff on folks living with housing instability, on-site mobile methadone services, harm reduction supplies, among many others. Next slide, please. She and Aurora clinics are structured as a walk-in clinic model with primary care services and a focus on HIV STI and viral hepatitis care. Some additional services include Suboxone, substance use treatment referrals, harm reduction supplies and training, and Medicaid enrollment. The services include an incentive component such as grocery store gift cards and snacks for other for certain types of visits and testing. Importantly, the clinic can also serve as a hub for telehealth visits for folks with specialty care needs. The medical team is small but mighty uh, and comprised of several physicians, nurses, social workers, and program coordinator. And of course, in collaboration with Aurora Commons advocates and other staff members. All team members approach care using a status neutral, trauma-informed, and harm reduction lens. Although not as, not as much has been published so far on SHE and Aurora clinics as Max or Maud, a study on a cohort of early SHE, uh, SHE clinic patients showed decreased use of the ED for non-emergent needs. Next slide, thanks. Uh, to give you an idea of what the commons and the clinic spaces look like, here are some photos of Aurora Commons and the SHE Aurora clinics. The commons is very intentionally designed and focused on being a gathering place rather than having an institutionalized or medicalized feel. It's designed to look like a living room and kitchen once you enter the space as you can tell from the layout and the wood paneling and everything like that. People enter and can bring and can hang out and also access services at the same time. And the left photo towards the back, that's actually where the clinic space is. Next slide, please. The clinic space has a lounge area where the team sits and patients can interface briefly before getting roomed. So that's on the far left. And the middle and the right photos show the two clinic rooms uh, that um, house the um, she and Aurora clinics. Next slide, please. The most recent addition to Madison's offsite low barrier clinics are the Engage clinics. The Engage clinics came about due to a need for similar status neutral trauma informed and harm reduction based services in South King County, where recently the greatest number of new HIV diagnoses in the county have occurred. Coverage of HIV services in uh, South King County has been low as most services are located centrally in South King County, uh, in sorry, in Seattle and King County, reflecting where the epidemic has historically been. Additionally, the socio-demographics and income levels are different than other parts of Seattle and King County, requiring an approach that is more adapted to the local context. Um, the engaged clinics are a partnership 
between Harbor Views Madison Clinic and Office-Based Opioid Treatment Program with Catholic Community Services of Western Washington. Similar to She Aurora Clinic's partnership with Aurora Commons, I can't emphasize enough about the wonderful and fantastic relationship we're continuing to build with CCS. This partnership is also critical in building relationships with clients and community partners in the area, delivering the best care that we can and understanding how to adapt our care for the local environment and context. The idea for these clinics was similar to She and Aurora Clinic to provide a comprehensive integrated set of services for individuals in the moment and meet them where they are when they use the data. So far, Engage Clinics has opened in Federal Way back in December of 2022, and Kent is nearing opening very soon. Next slide, please. Thanks. The Engage Clinics are funded by also by the Ending the HIV Epidemic from Medical Services with additional support from SAMHSA for our OBOT services. Engage has a similar model as She and Aurora Clinics with walk-in integrated primary care services with a special focus on HIV, STI, and viral hepatitis care. See, um, we also have a similar structure for staff and set of services, as well as including incentives and telehealth capability. CCS also has similar services as the Commons for basic needs and non-medical case management. However, they also have mental and behavioral health services with outreach, counseling, and prescribing abilities. The SAMHSA funding has also allowed for greater implementation of Suboxone care using the Massachusetts model for office-based opioid treatment, which is a nurse-centered model that allows for additional opportunities for outreach and touch points for care. So hopefully um, advancing patient care for Suboxone and other medications for opioid use disorder. Similar to Aurora and Chi, all team members of Engage and CCS practice status-neutral trauma-informed and harm reduction care. As noted before, community partnerships are super important to extend services and also outreach. We've started building our community partnerships to help extend services with local OBGYNs and emergency departments, as well as multiple community-based organizations for PrEP, HIV services, and Suboxone, as well as local methadone clinics and mental health providers to help both be um, a referral base for us, as well as to extend our services. Next slide, please. Thanks. Um, what I covered were just how Madison Clinic has implemented several status neutral interventions in Seattle and King County. Status neutral interventions have also been successfully implemented at multiple levels from the city to state across the US, such as in New York City, Texas, and Chicago, just highlighting a few here, which are um, highlighted more in detail in the included links below. Next slide, please. So to recap and bring it all together, Madison Clinic with its multiple partners at Harborview, the community and public health has been able to build out a spectrum or menu, if you will, of care models and interventions tailored for different populations at risk or with HIV adapted for local context and needs. Status neutral and DSD frameworks have helped inform the development of these models and the components of care that you see here. In the near future, there is also an HIV mobile outreach team from public health under development just starting its pilot phase to help improve linkage to care. This is super exciting and more to come on this, hopefully in the near future. Next slide. So in summary, ending the HIV epidemic will require novel patient-centered strategies. We have many of the necessary tools already, but these need to be used in the right context with approaches focused on individual needs. Status neutral and DSD approaches help do this. We hope that we've shown in our examples here that low barrier care models can be what is needed for certain individuals with complex needs to be successful, sometimes requiring frequent and rapid adaptations and modifications. And that having a wide spectrum of services, services is helpful, but they must be adapted for local context. That is, having local community partnerships and listening to the needs of clients is a, key, uh, is a keystone to success for these strategies. Next slide. So we really wanna emphasize the team and collaborative nature of this enterprise. And without any of the folks on this slide, the work and success wouldn't be possible. We wanna say thank you to Julie, Maria, and Maggie for their assistance on building this talk and allowing us to adapt several other slides. We also wanna thank and acknowledge all of our team members, community partners, funders, and most of all, our patients for the privilege of representing them and sharing all the work we've done together and all we've learned from them. Next slide. Finally, we wanna put a plug in for a talk by, on low barrier clinics by Dr. Julie Dombrowski tomorrow, um, who will speak uh, to this from the public health perspective. You can sign up for the talk with the QR code on this slide.
And with that, I'd like to thank you all for your attention and open it up for questions. People can feel free to <clears throat> um, put it in the Q&A or in the chat. Um, thank you both for this wonderful talk and really laying it out for um, how these models work and how um, you've created these partnerships in the communities to really um, bring the care outside of our brick and mortar hospital-based clinic setting, which I think is, is really key as we know that many patients don't go there. Um, these clinics are relatively new, and I kind of wanted to ask for both of you, what do you think is the biggest challenge going forward um, to in meeting these patients where they are um, that you see kind of on the ground on a day-to-day -day basis? Jamie, I'm going to let you um, take that one first since you're on the ground building a clinic right now. Oh, great question. Um, I think right now, um, I think I would say the biggest challenges will depend on where and how mature the program is. But um, at least for my uh, situation at Engage right now, um, the biggest challenge I think is being able to um, meet the needs as they come, I would say, because um, the needs continue to change. And right now, um, I would say for me, um, the biggest challenge is trying to um, um, get patients to the care uh, appointments that they need, um, finding the transportation, the care navigation. Our system is really complex, and we can provide a certain level of care at our um, clinics, but um, in reality, uh, there's so much more to it, and actually getting patients to the appointments and getting the care that they need at those appointments is um, is, is a huge challenge, especially in a setting where uh, in South King County, one of the unique things is that we have um, the, the health system is very um, fragmented and disparate and really hard to, um, and really spread out and actually getting folks to their various appointments has been a, a challenge that we're still working on. Yeah, I think I, just to echo Jimmy, I think we both have the experience of working at a low barrier on-site clinic with MOD and then um, an off-site clinic. And I think the some of the challenges are really, you know, I talked about the idea of meeting people where they're at and streamlining care, but it's really becomes functionally difficult at certain points. And I think we've all faced that, um, that, you know, at, at MOD, since we're at Madison, we can walk someone downstairs to x-ray and, you know, all these attrition points where we lose people, the pharmacies on site. And that's been really difficult at Aurora. Um, I think almost more as a provider to struggle with, um, to think about what are the ways that we can um, make, make things easier in terms of access for patients. And I think that's going to be an ongoing change, especially as Jimmy's pointing out and alluding to our system keeps changing and the, the challenges that we face with um, new substance use struggles and, you know, new financial changes at the federal level and, and these kinds of things. And I think that's why I was really thinking about this idea of um, rapid commitment to modification as a key component of low barrier care. And I think really being thoughtful about what's changed, what's not working, what's working, let's scrap something, let's build it up. And um, and I think, Sharisha, that, that at least gets to the point of how do we start addressing some of these challenges? Because I don't they're not going to stop. They're just going to shift and change as we go. Yeah, I think that's great. The adaptability, I think, like that you mentioned is is key. There are a few other great questions here. Um, uh, Julie is asking um, about how do um, how do you think that LBC models apply outside of the urban context? Um, you mentioned that there are other models elsewhere, but it seem mostly urban. I can tackle this question. So I think that um, leveraging and using um, technology is going to be super important in these areas where um, care is going to be super spread out. Resources are a little bit more thin. And I think um, that means that telehealth, I think, is going to be really important in these kinds of models. Um, it'll be also, I think, important to make sure that robust transportation, peer navigation is uh, involved in these um, interventions as well, because 
um, oftentimes rural jurisdictions um, often have um, only uh, certain specialties, certain um, uh, the ability to access care only in certain areas. And so there's got to be ways to extend that. And I think in some ways, for example, our ECHO program here um, shows it's not exactly the exact same fit, but it provides a great um, example where expertise can be shared amongst multiple different individuals. Um, I'll use um, opioid use disorder treatment as an example. Um, the um, having telehealth, a mobile van, um, some of these novel um, interventions have been uh, trialed throughout the U.S. especially and in the Washington state, um, which is actually um, a pretty, um, we're at the cutting edge of a lot of these innovations and um, have a lot of support from policymakers. And so um, I think leveraging some of the technology aspects, being mobile and um, addressing uh, transportation needs is gonna be um, also very important towards um, these low barrier care models in rural contexts. Great. Um, Matt Mederschmidt has a couple of questions. Um, curious to hear your perspectives on the importance of incentives um, and the pull draw of um, in-kind incentives versus gift card style incentives. Yeah, I can, I mean, I can at least speak to that from the perspective of, of Maud. And I think, you know, the, the idea of incentives and those who work in Max have more experience with this, but we, we do use them at Aurora and she and then Jimmy at Engage, is that this is kind of informed by like contingency management, behavioral economics approaches of not just um, rewarding financially behavior, but I think also, you know, being on the level of the patient saying that there are basic needs you have to meet that medical care is not going to give you day to day your ability to buy food and you know pay the copay on certain pills or do your laundry and i think in that sense it makes a lot of sense and there is you know i think a robust literature about this beyond uh, low barrier care for hiv that said i think it's not necessarily the case that everyone needs that or that'll drive people to engage more than others um, and I, I'm sure, I'm sorry, I missed the second part of the question about the different kinds of incentives. Yeah, I think just the importance of um, either gift card or okay. in-kind incentives. Yeah, and again, I think it gets to that issue of, you know, people who are really marginally housed or don't have access to food or care or transportation can really benefit in ways that make their lives better. And again, this is to thinking about the client facing person or the client perspective and rather than our uh, medical goals that might be longer term. But yeah, I think we, we've all struggled with the idea of do people, is it is it a critical component of low barrier care? And I do think that there are probably intangible incentives to coming in more frequently. Not everyone needs them. I think to Julie's question about the urban setting, I think there are certain things that are easier if you live closer and there is easier transport and we're able to provide say bus vouchers. Um, and so, I think it's just kind of feeling out, and I know there's been some discrete choice experiment work thinking about or upcoming work on what is going to be the most important component. Um, and I know I'm going on, but I just wanted to say that the pop-up clinic had done a an evaluation looking at their clients and asking what was the most important thing to them, which component of low barrier care was really the most important. And while incentives for some was ranked pretty high, it was really walk-in access that walk that ranked quite high. And again, there were different groups, not everyone felt the same way, um, but I think it can be of varying importance and definitely important in, in providing a spectrum of care, but not necessarily in all low barrier care. Can I also hop on that real quick here? Um, I think the incentives are um, a way to get the foot in the door for some people and other folks, it might not be as important. I think um, anecdotally, and from what I've heard from other folks at Max, is that um, once that relationship is built, um, incentives are, you know, helpful, but um, it's not the um, end all be all for people to access care. And even in our short time at Engage down south, um, we've had that um, kind of be the case as well. So um, there's a certain level of foundational needs that need to be met. Um, folks need to be able to have clothing on their back, you know. Um, have ability to um, address food needs and stuff like that. But once, and oftentimes uh, the day centers, at least um, from what I've seen, are able to provide at least uh, 
some of that. And so um, if you, um, depending on how you conceptualize incentives, those in-kind or those basic needs are met, um, once oftentimes those are met, um, they uh, can potentially engage and care a little bit better. But um, whether the um, cash incentives or the gift cards are necessary, I think those are, that's um, potentially more at least from my anecdotal experience, um, icing on the cake as um, the relationship is built. Thank you. There's a couple other questions. Um, the other one by uh, Matt is curious to hear whether the barrier of limited days, example, Tuesdays, Thursdays, seems easily overcome by the walk-in nature of the clinic or continues to be a substantial barrier. Sorry, could you hear that question? Sorry, I didn't hear okay. that fully, but that might have been on my end. Oh, okay. Uh, Matt's wondering whether the, there is a barrier um, of having the limited days, if it's easily overcome by the walk-in nature, or if it continues to be a substantial barrier. Yeah, it's a, it's a really good question. I think, you know, at Aurora She, when we talk about people who identify um, as women or men, I think functionally on Mondays and Tuesdays at Aurora Clinic, we do see women too. That's not the issue. I think there are certain days that we say, you know, we prior we're prioritizing, you know, and she clinic seeing women. So it's, you know, there's always going to be some barriers, but um, I don't think it's unovercomable for lack of better term. I think the bigger thing that we think about also is, you know, we're still operating primarily during business hours for better or worse. And I think of that as a bigger barrier to patients who struggle with, you know, coming in. We see, we, I, I know in MOD, for example, we see a lot of people who come in right at 445, um, right before the clinic is going to close. And it's not just provider will, but clinic resource will. And so I think that's something that I think as we think about beyond our existing clinic structures, what, what other um, low barrier settings might be able to do, that would be important to think about. To piggyback off of that, um, at Engage right now, um, we're not necessarily having um, specific days that we're not there yet, but once Kent opens, um, we're going to have a, our provider and um, some other team members kind of bouncing between the two clinics. And so um, ways that we're, we've tried to extend our um, capabilities is to have um, certain staff members, like a nurse and our program coordinator, having one on each site there every single day to help continue and um, at least engagement and continue to advance care, um, care coordination, all that kind of stuff. Um, so um, in a way, that's kind of similar to what you were asking about whether limited hours or limited days um, affects that. I would say the walk-in model um, is more important. Um, but um, I think there are ways that we could uh, that we can innovate and um, expand care to um, address those needs. I will say on days that we haven't had providers and it's, an, um, it's um, just been a team without um, a clinician there. Um, our experience is that some of the services are limited, but um, a lot can be done still with a provider uh, remotely available, um, either through um, like, for example, Suboxone treatment or even um, helping triage or refills, um, stuff like that. So it's possible um, with the power of technology. Great. Um, one other question here is regarding communication and are there certain tech resources, communication apps, texting that your team is using to provide secure um, HIPAA compliant texting with clients or other low barrier methods of communication that you're using? I can start with this one. Um, so right now, um, actually the biggest barrier is um, a lot of our clients just don't have phones. And so um, technology um, is um, a little bit challenging sometimes with them. And sometimes they do have a phone, but they don't have cell service and is Wi-Fi only. And so we've had to be creative about that. And oftentimes it is still the old fashioned waiting for them to show up in the clinic or 
Um, we've worked with the HIV mobile team and having a touch point there or having other case management who can do outreach services there. So um, we have been able to, um, uh, if we have um, the ability to confirm phone and all that, um, we've been sticking to um, text messaging or emails, um, making sure that, you know, confirming that that is what the patient has. Um, there are other ways that um, that aren't necessarily communicating um, PHI, um, where folks I've heard use um, social media to just contact folks, but um, that's typically done with uh, non uh, without PHI involved. Um, it's more just as I've heard more just like, oh, hey, you're due for a visit, please come see us, kind of more general message for folks. Um, Rocket, do you have any other experience potentially? No, I think echoing that experience, um, you know, at, at the clinics, we, we do have a cell phone contact with patients um, through, you know, Harborview provided phones that uh, clinic staff can use to text and call patients and patients can get in contact. Um, for those who do have phones, again, that's a minority uh, at Aurora and she especially, there's the MyChart app for Epic. Um, but I think the other thing I wanted to point out among, among the creative methods we're using, or we use this is, I think, very old school, which is just calling where they're housing and, and other community partners like Bailey Boucher House, where many people stay or drop in. And then, again, leveraging those um, community connections to really try to communicate to get people in and, and to call us. Uh, I would add also that um, some of the um, case management services that I mentioned is building those, or sorry, peer navigation and community organizations that building connections with, um, they some uh, clients often are um, much more accessible by those folks. Like we've um, made connections with Entre Hermanos Center for Multicultural Health among a few, and they've actually been really crucial and critical in, um, in addition to some of the other partnerships that we've mentioned through public health to actually outreaching the folks that um, we uh, need to get in contact with. Great, thank you. Looks like those are all the questions. I want to echo, echo some of the comments that this was a, a, a great talk. Thank you both so much for sharing your knowledge and experience about these clinics and doing this really important work. Um, excited to see how these programs grow, um, particularly engaged since it's very new, um, but also just kind of regarding your um, rapid modification and adaptability model to see where these clinics are in a few years in terms of how they're operating. So really exciting work. Thank you both so much. Great. Thanks everybody for coming and thank you Julie also for participating and Sharisha.